January 21st, 1988, Nullabar Plain, Australia. The Knowles family is enjoying a nice drive across the Nullabar Plain when a glowing object picks up their car, carries it for a little bit, and drops it on the ground, changing their lives forever. For the Knowles family, it was to have been a routine drive across the Nullabar. That all changed as the family approached the town of Mundrabilla on the Air Highway. They claim that's when they had their unexpected and terrifying encounter with the unknown. The car was shaking. Um, I went down the window and I said it's on top of the roof. And all this, I don't know what it was, it all come inside the car along the smoke. We thought we were all dead. And I went down the window and Mum said there's something on the roof. And I said no, come off it, you know, you've got to be joking. And she went down there and went out and she put her hand on the, on the roof and she goes, my God, she goes, what is it? And I, no, I swear to God, I'm not lying. I swear to God, I opened up my window, and the car started going out of control. And all this smoke, and it was like smoke. I'm not, I'm not lying, it was like smoke. And gases all started coming out. And me and my brother started to go crazy, you know. I thought it was going in my head. It felt like my brain was getting sucked out. Another motorist and a truck driver also witnessed the incident. They confirmed the Knowles family story. Police are investigating the claim. They say the car did have dents on the roof and an ash substance inside. Late today, the Knowles family returned to the scene of their experience for the last time. And uh, you won't travel that stretch of road again? No way. You, you, don't don't even, you don't even wish to travel in your own car? No. Rod Stephen, 7 News. In 1988, Port Talbot, UK. This sleepy and beautiful little town has a history of UFOs stretching back for quite some time. In 1988, five different witnesses reported seeing a triangular-shaped black craft flying slowly over town and heading out to the coast. May 15, 1989, Area 51, Las Vegas, Nevada. Bob Lazar comes out on Las Vegas Channel 8 News with George Knapp and makes history, disclosing that he has been working on a UFO reverse engineering program dealing with propulsion systems at a secret base called Area 51, a term that was previously unknown to the general public. Specifically, Bob said that he worked at a location called S4 that was built into the side of a hill and disguised to look like the hillside itself. According to Bob, the facility had nine hangars, each with a UFO that was either intact and functional or disassembled for reverse engineering efforts. At least one of them had some projectile damage to the hull. Bob's descriptions of the propulsion system match the gimbal object filmed by U.S. Navy pilots. Fleet of them, look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, that thing, dude. That's not our LNS though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, the flare's like Look at that thing. It's rotating. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. And uh, they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of of completion built from other parts and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. You say there's nine saucers, how, how are those tests going? Uh, as far as what? As far as whether they're successful and, and, and that sort of thing. Oh well some of them uh, are a hundred percent intact and operate perfectly. Uh, the other ones are being taken apart. Uh, I was involved mainly in, in propulsion and the power source uh, and, uh, you know, basically, uh, as far as I can remember, there are about half of them do operate, and the other half are, are just been torn down, uh, basically to analyze the components to them. According to Lazar, his employer was the United States Navy. He says he and other government employees would gather near EG&G, &G, fly to Groom Lake, and then a very few people would get into a bus with blacked out or no windows and drive to S4. When you get off the bus, what do you see? It's a very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees, 
the, uh, which are hangar doors. And it has textured paint on it, but it's, it looks like sand. It's made to look like the side of the mountain that it's in, whether it's to disguise it from satellite photographs or what. He says he was never told exactly what he'd be working on, but figured it had something to do with advanced propulsion. On his first day, he was told to read a series of briefings and immediately realized how advanced the propulsion was. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, they run gravity amplifiers. There's actually two parts to the drive mechanism. Uh, it's just, it's a bizarre technology. There's no physical hookup between any of the systems in there. Uh, they use gravity as a wave using waveguides, almost like microwaves. It took a while, Lazar says, before he actually saw one of the flying disks. However, there were hints everywhere. Right, they had a poster, and it looked like a commercial poster almost, like it was lithographed and you could buy it at a Kmart or something. But they were all over the place and it had the, the disk that I coined the term the sport model was lifted off the ground about three feet at, at uh, area S4 on the dry lake there, and uh, the catch on the bottom said they're here. September 27, 1989, Voronezh, Soviet Union. Some boys playing football in a city park saw a pink glow in the sky, then saw a deep red ball about three meters in diameter. The ball circled, vanished, then reappeared minutes later and hovered. The children claim to have seen a three-eyed alien wearing bronze-colored boots with a disc on the chest and a robot exiting the object. According to the children, the alien used a ray gun to make a 16-year-old boy disappear until the object departed. Though the children were the only ones claiming to have witnessed the aliens, Lieutenant Matviev of the Voronezh District Police Station claimed to have seen a body flying in the sky. The Interior Ministry said they would dispatch troops to the area should the object reappear. November 30th, 1989, Manhattan, New York City. At 3.15 a.m., Linda Napolitano is sleeping in bed. She wakes up with that feeling of being watched and sees a four-foot-tall gray being at the end of her bed. It's got a large head with dark eyes and gray skin. Linda is scared and throws a pillow at it. The being puts a message in her head to be quiet. A white cloth covers her face and she falls back on the bed and becomes paralyzed but still awake. A bright blue beam of light shines through the window and levitates Linda. The beam then folds her into a fetal position and carries her along the beam of light right through the wall of her apartment and into the cold night air. She is then unfolded and is floating upright above the city, heading towards the Brooklyn Bridge with three creatures by her side, still trapped in the bright blue beam. She's over 12 stories in the air. Up ahead she sees a massive clam-shaped mothership. Later on, over two dozen people report seeing this exact scene. The next thing she remembers is being inside the mothership in a stark gray hallway with benches along the walls. Then next she's in a circular room with an examination table in the middle. She is then levitated into the air and onto the table. She's paralyzed and screaming for her life. One of the aliens puts his hand over her mouth and communicates to her that she needs to calm down. They then conduct an examination of her with a light and then insert a metal object up her nose. She wakes up at 5 a.m. back in her bed with a hazy memory of what had just happened. A few days later, she gets an x-ray which shows a metal object in her nose. And then a month later, she's abducted again and the object is removed. February 12th through the 13th, 1989, Fife, Alabama. On those two nights, more than 50 people in a town of just under 2,000 claim to see a UFO. Those who spotted it described it as hovering at an angle with bright lights on the top, bottom, and center, and its curvature outlined in green. At the time of the sightings, Junior Garmany was the town's chief of police, and Fred Works, his assistant chief. When Junior and them went out and looked at it, they said it looked like a big banana, Smith explained. It didn't have any sound, and they kind of chased it around. The two officers chased the object on County Road 43. Officer Works said the object appeared to be a wide triangle that produced no sound whatsoever. What I saw that first time was like nothing I ever saw before, Germany stated after the sighting. It was not a helicopter, it was not a plane, not a sound. A lady had called an object in the sky in, and uh, the chief and myself went out to check it out, and we saw a bright, a bright white light in the sky before we ever got to her, uh, her location. And uh, 
we stopped and, and, and watched it. It was like maybe two fingers over the horizon, over the treetop horizon, and appeared to be moving at a very slow pace. And it would get brighter and then dimmer, almost like a light turning towards you and then away from you. So we stopped the vehicle and observed it for a few minutes, just, I don't know, two or three minutes, and decided we would try to drive toward it. So we radioed a town down south of us, and uh, I believe their chief was on duty at that time, and he, uh, he confirmed that he saw the object, and it appeared to have some blinking lights on it, like maybe a, a red and green colored lights. A police officer from uh, uh, Crossville radioed and said that uh, he told us his location and, and said that a large object had flown over him at a fast pace, flying in a, a west and south direction. Well, evidently we were in the path of that object. We stopped and got out and looked back toward the east. And I saw this object coming over the treetops. And it appeared to have kind of a, I don't know, like a, a white lights on it. They, they weren't actually shining where they were real bright, you could just tell they were on it, and, and there was kind of a glow of the lights around it. And uh, I told Junior, I said, there's, I said, there's the object he's talking about. And I said, it appears to be an airplane. And I said, well, uh, I, I said, it's, it's, it don't look exactly like an airplane. It's, it, uh, and it kept flying toward us, and it, it flew right straight over our heads, and it was hard to tell what distance, you know, what height it was. Maybe, we, we estimated maybe 1,500 to 2,000 feet, and, and possibly as big as, a, as big as a football field. And it had three, three huge, like, spotlights, kind of triangle shape, with the, with the one being more toward the front. But they were not shining, they weren't shining at the ground, they were like, shining back up on the craft itself. So I asked the chief, I said, cut, cut the car engine off. And like I said, there was no other background noises. The car was dead, you know, we, we shut the engine down, it was dead. And here this big object come flying over, and I mean, if you, you know, put your hands up like this, that's, that's about how big it looked to you. Bigger than a beach ball, you know. That's big or bigger. And, uh, we watched it fly over us, and, and then we turned, you know, no sound whatsoever. We watched it go off south and, and west of us. Never a sound. If we'd have been looking down at the ground, we'd have never known it was there. Fred and I uh, pulled over on the side of the road on County Road 43 and stopped our patrol car, shut the engine off, and got out. And at, at that time, the object came directly over uh, our patrol car, and we were looking up underneath it. And uh, the, the object appeared to me that it was some 1,000, 1,500 feet higher, had three real bright lights underneath it uh, that were shining not on the ground to illuminate the ground, but shining back up underneath the craft to illuminate the craft itself. And there was some, some lights around what I call the face of the craft or the crown of it, whatever you may call it. Uh, appeared looking up through the, the glare of those other lights. Uh, maybe green, blue, or red, or, or some of them might have been white. It was a large craft, and uh, it had no sound whatsoever. It just continued in its, you know, didn't descend or pick up any speed or anything, just a steady speed just right over us and, and went right on out of sight. Sometime after that, now after 89 of February the 10th, we had several calls. Of the night of February the 10th, we had several calls, and they've been scattered reports ever since then. I had a person come in uh, just last night. Uh, Marty Roberts in a Grobo carrier came in, and he described this this object to me and, and drew me a, a diagram of it on a paper, and it was something similar to what I had seen on February the 10th of 89. Uh, and he's seen that this past date. Eleven PM, March thirtieth, nineteen ninety, Biersit, Belgium. A UFO flap had begun in Belgium in November of nineteen eighty nine, with this nineteen ninety case being the peak of the sightings. An hour before midnight in Biersit, one unknown object was tracked on radar and two Belgian Air Force F-16s were sent to investigate 
with neither pilot reporting seeing the object. Over the next two weeks, reports from 143 people who claimed to have witnessed the object were received, all of them after the event. Over the ensuing months, many others claimed to have witnessed these events as well. Following the incident, the Belgium Air Force released a report detailing the events of that night. At around 11 p.m., the supervisor for the Control Reporting Center at the Glans received reports that three unusual lights were seen moving towards the southeast of Brussels. Glans CRC requested a patrol to confirm the sighting. About 10 minutes later, more reports came in stating that a second set of lights were seen moving towards the first triangle. Traffic Center Control at Semmerzock tracked one object only on its radar and an order to scramble two F-16 fighters from Bovishan Air Force Base was given. Throughout this time, in reports after the event, some people claimed that the phenomena was visible from the ground, describing the whole formation as maintaining their relative positions while moving slowly across the sky. Over the next hour, the two scrambled F-16s attempted nine separate interceptions of the targets. On three occasions, they managed to obtain a radar lock for a few seconds, but these were later shown to be radar locks on each other. After 12.30, radar contact became much more sporadic and the final confirmed lock took place at 12.40. Following several further unconfirmed contacts, the F-16s eventually returned to base shortly after 1. Members of the patrol, who had been sent to confirm the original report, described four lights now being arranged in a square formation, all making short jerky movements before gradually losing their luminosity and disappearing in four separate directions at around 1.30. August 1, 1990, Škoder, Albania. Gazim Dapi, an environmental engineer born in Tirana, recounts a strange event that happened to him during the summer of 1990 while serving in the military in Škoder. In the summer of 1990, I was serving my mandatory military service in the village of Barhaj in Škoder. My military unit was responsible for anti-aircraft defense. We were all trained to identify different types of planes during the day and night, and our unit had military technology tools that could distinguish planes at close and far distances. On the night of August 1st, I was on duty. At around 2.30 in the morning, a series of 100 to 150 lights arranged in a strange pattern, resembling the shape of a diamond and about 20 meters in size, appeared in the sky at high speed with very little noise, similar to the sound of a flock of birds. It was not an airplane or any other flying object that we knew of. Moreover, it had a very high speed and made very little noise. Yazim reported this strange event to the central operator of the battalion at the time. There he learned that he was not alone. Five other soldiers from different anti-aircraft units who were on duty at the time had reported the exact same thing to me. The next day, officers asked us about it, but no city or radar in Albania had identified it except for us soldiers who saw it with our own eyes. August 4th, 1990, Calvin, Scotland. Two men were working as chefs in a hotel in Pitlochry in the Scottish Highlands when one summer evening they decided to go for a walk in the hills near Calvin. While out walking, the two spotted a huge diamond-shaped flying object moving silently in the sky and it scared them. They ran into some woodland to sort of keep their heads down and they heard this jet come down the valley and then two minutes later it returned and started circling around the object and that's when they took the photographs that have become part of history. Only this one photograph is available, although six were taken, the Ministry of Defense has sealed them until the year 2075. Twenty fourth, 1990, somewhere on a farm in England. Farmer Albert Bull sees two 1,000 foot tall black tubes that look almost like a tornado in his field says he's never seen anything like that before. When he goes over to take a look, he says that the ground's being disturbed underneath him, but it's not vacuuming the soil up into the tube like a tornado would. Again, he says he's never seen anything like this in the 50 years that he's worked these fields. It was over overcast, no sunshine, sort of a dull-ish sort of day. And uh, suddenly, in front of me was a tube running up about a thousand feet. Oh, well, I'm not a good judge, but I would say a thousand feet plus are coming down out of sight onto the ground. This was not very many yards away from me, but the important point about it that struck me with it 
was the circular motion of the ashes in the grit on the ground. It didn't appear to be being sucked up the tube, it was just rotating at high speed on the ground, about two feet wide, two feet six perhaps on the ground. And the, and the tube was vertical and perpendicular and it didn't grow at the top or anything. And that was unusual, that was one of the unusual things about it. And this went on for several minutes. And then this died away and then another one appeared about 200 yards from me then in the other corner of the field and this was a similar situation again lasting about the same time it's this field here it was in winter barley at the time it's a cornfield most of the time and looking across diagonally looking at the wood behind it was to the left about halfway along the wood line that you can probably see mm -hmm. on the film the first one where i was stood in the field nearby and this, then when that died away, the second one appeared near the tree over near the woods oh, in, the, yeah, yeah, in the far yeah, distance, yeah, yeah. just in the field there. And the same thing happened there. But it was uncanny. I've worked these fields for 50 years and uh, I've never seen anything like it before. Nothing, nothing at all like it. August 24th, 1990, Greveswald, Germany. A man and his girlfriend are enjoying some time in a local beer garden when they notice some strange lights in the sky. The lights are unlike anything they've ever seen before and remain visible for over an hour. The video that they take is quite interesting. Die UFO-Forscher machen sich auf die Reise von Xanten nach Usedom und treffen Augenzeugen. Jens Hollatz saß damals mit seiner Freundin im Biergarten in Albeck. Und dann habe ich da hinten praktisch zwischen den beiden Bäumen. Vielleicht kann man das mal zeigen. Und da drüber waren diese Leuchtobjekte. Hast du damals irgendwas mitbekommen? Äh, Flieger gehört, äh, Flugzeuge Gar gesehen? Gar nichts. Geräuschlos. Okay. Und dann eben diese bewegten Bilder nach oben, nach unten. So etwas hatte der gebürtige Usedommer noch nie gesehen. Die Begegnung mit dem Unerklärlichen lässt ihm keine Ruhe. Das ist nichts Normales. So einfach ist das. Ich bin jetzt kein UFO-Fanatiker oder so. Das will ich auf keinen Fall damit ausdrücken. Aber äh, wäre schon interessant zu wissen, was ist da wirklich gewesen. Auch der nächste Zeuge erinnert sich genau an jenen Tag, als plötzlich der Himmel anfing zu leuchten. Hallo. Das war ein Phänomen. Ne? Also die ganze Düne stand voller Menschen, um diese zu sehen. Das waren Lichterketten, die hingen am Himmel. Die Leuchtkugeln. Okay. Können Sie sich noch erinnern, wie lange Sie das ungefähr beobachtet haben? Oh, das war ewig, das Stunde bestimmt. So lange glüht kein militärischer Leuchtkörper, weiß Kettmann. Also das ist sehr interessant und widerspricht dem militärischen noch mehr. Das Greifswaldphänomen bleibt rätselhaft, doch die UFO-Forscher bleiben dran. Vielleicht finden sie ihn ja noch, den ultimativen Beweis. Die Hoffnung ist natürlich bei allen Fällen, die erstmal nicht geklärt werden können, da, dass man irgendwann vielleicht doch den Hinweis findet oder den Beweis, dass es vielleicht doch irgendwas Intelligentes ist, das nicht von dieser Welt kommt. November 7th, November 7th, 1990, Montreal, Canada. A woman is swimming in a hotel's rooftop pool when she notices a strange light in the sky. It is a series of four lights, each consisting of three lights, something she has never seen before. She calls to the lifeguard to take a look, and he also sees it. At this point, they call the police and a reporter who arrive together and also witness the mysterious lighted object in the sky. Strange lights can be seen in the night sky above the Place Bonaventure Hotel. On November 7, 1990, a tourist floating in the hotel's 17-story rooftop pool saw something which set off a chain reaction. It was 7.20 p.m. She saw a very hard aerial phenomenon and uh, she, she, she was surprised, so she, she asked the lifeguard. Uh, to, to have a look at it. Uh, Bernard Guinette has chronicled the events of that night. Uh, she was also very surprised by what she was seeing, so she called the hotel security officer and 
as soon as he saw uh, the aerial phenomenon uh, was overwhelmed and they called immediately the police. Gilles Béliveau, a reporter with La Presse, was also dispatched to the scene. He happened to ride the hotel elevator with a policeman. We were going, going up, you see. He asked, uh, may I use my gun? <laughs> you see, it was just a joke and the people were laughing. I was laughing. Uh, when we arrived together on the roof, he looked at me in the sky and he said, Sacre <laughs> Il was astonish, uh, like I was. On a vu une forme ronde qui semblait métallique, qui projetait des, des faisceaux lumineux, qui avait quatre séries de trois forts. C'était gigantesque. If he decided that he had to call his big boss, and so the big uh, director of all operation of the police that night uh, uh, arrive uh, also on the scene and was overwhelm overwhelmed by what he was seeing. So he called the RCMP. I got here at the hotel uh, at about nine o'clock and I came up, met Sergeant Bonjour. Masson and a lot of people Bonjour. around the pool. We were look, looking up. I contacted the airport, uh, the military. I talked to uh, the colonel in charge of saint Hubert uh, military operations. Uh, and I was told that there was no uh, no Canadian military operation going on. I also confirmed with Dorval and Mirabel if they had anything on radar, and uh, they answered in the negative. But yet you could see something there, and nobody could see what it was? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Nineteen ninety, Samara, Russia. A classic large black triangular UFO lands near a mobile radar unit and shoots a beam of light at it and destroys it. Этот объект приземлился и в ответ на прощупывание его радарами он выпустил мощный импульс в сторону антенны локатора и сжег ее. Антенна была разрушена. Возник большой переполох на военном объекте. Антенна горела, локатор был разрушен, часовые пропали. Полное сенсационное событие на военном секретном объекте вблизи города Самары. Когда вернулись пропавшие солдаты, когда объект улетел, обнаружили, что на поле, где он приземлился, был помят большой огород, какой-то мощный объемный взрыв или мощный объемный пресс incredibly in 1990 one of these ufos reportedly attacked a radar antenna near the soviet city of samara it was one of the most shocking ufo military confrontations on record a triangular shaped object uh, flew near a military base in samara and then landed right next to a mobile air defense uh, radar unit Apparently, the, um, the radar units turn to pick up, you know, this UFO. The UFO shot a beam at the radar and basically destroyed completely that radar unit. Winter of 1989 through 1990, Salisbury Plain, UK. In the winter of 1989 to 1990, six British soldiers encounter a UFO, get surrounded by a field of blue light, and then have some missing time. I received uh, a letter from um, Mark, who's an ex-British uh, soldier. One night during the winter of 1989-1990, he'd been out uh, on night maneuvers on Salisbury Plain. So basically all it was was a bar. Four, three and a half, four K march. Mark, a former British soldier who was stationed near the Salisbury Plain, has asked that his identity be hidden and his voice disguised. He still fears reprisals from the British Defence Ministry. So Mark would have uh, been hiking across this open piece of land, and as he approached this copse here, this wooded area here, we got to near the place where we were going to get picked up and it's just off to our left. And then suddenly this massive craft 
uh, appearing as if out of nowhere. And it was vast, great big, like triangular craft, and a, a very strong strobe light beaming down as if it was looking around for something. And the next thing Mark can remember is a guy dressed all in black, black flying suit, coming out of the copse, approaching the six soldiers, including Mark, holding this rod or prodding thing. It felt like sheep getting penned in with this like cone of light around us, like a, uh, almost a buzzing feel about it to your body. As he called it, bluish uh, cone of light that uh, eventually engulfed all six soldiers and kind of took over their minds. Um, very frightening experience. It's like you've got no, no control over it, something's controlling you, you have no control over it at all. As the soldiers sort of woke up from this uh, nightmare experience, they found themselves uh, 600 metres off course over in this direction, uh, wondering where they were and how on earth they, they got there. I still had this missing time, you know, which was making me pretty agitated. The feelings that I go through my head is uh, I was a guinea pig. I'm really angry about it. April 21st, 1991, London, England. Achille Zaghetti was at the helm of a jet from Milan to London's Heathrow Airport on the evening of April 21st, 1991, when a flying object streaked across his field of vision. At once I said, look out, look out, to my co-pilot who looked out and saw what I had seen, Zaghetti wrote in his report. As soon as the object crossed us, I asked to the area control center operator if he saw something on his screen, and he answered, I see an unknown target 10 nautical miles behind you. An investigation later ruled out a missile, but never ruled anything in either. June 17, 1991, Hamburg, Germany. Four passengers on a Hamburg-bound Dan Air 737 spotted a wingless projectile pass below and to the left of the aircraft as the flight climbed out of London's Gatewick Airport. It would seem to have passed fairly close by as the passengers were able to see it quite clearly, the Civil Aviation Authority wrote in its report. July 11, 1991, Mexico City. Eric Aguilar, a 19-year-old student at the University of Mexico, was setting up to film the eclipse from a rooftop when he spotted something unusual in the sky. At first, all we saw was a white dot in the sky, that's all we could see in the beginning. Later we saw that this dot was shining brightly, it wasn't a dot anymore, it was a larger object and it was giving off light, it was shining. At about the same time, 60 miles from Mexico City, a businessman named Luis Lara videotaped a similar object. As I raised the camera, you could see something in the clouds and it was a metal object. You could see clearly it's not a star, it's a UFO because it had a shadow underneath. If it were a star or a planet, you would see clearly that it would be completely luminous. But this one had a little shadow underneath. Another video was shot by the Breton family in Puebla, a city 80 miles east of Mexico City. Magnifying the Breton video revealed an odd, wave-like disturbance behind the pulsating disk. July 1991, Gatwick Airport, UK. A crew aboard a Gatwick-bound Britannia Airways Boeing 737 who saw a small black lozenge-shaped object zipping past about 100 yards to the left of the aircraft. The airport confirmed seeing an object on its radar and clocked it traveling at 120 miles per hour. Air traffic controllers quickly warned the next aircraft to turn out of the object's flight path, although by then the object had disappeared from view. August 18th, 1991, the town of Carp in West Carleton, Canada. An anonymous individual videotaped a UFO floating in the back of a small farm. It was covered in rainbow-colored lights that were flashing and left an impression in the field that was visible the next day. 
West Carlton, Canada, 1991. On a small farm, a pulsating glowing craft was captured on video by an anonymous source. To this day, many experts say this could be the best video of an alien spacecraft landing on terrestrial soil. Bob Exler, a former NASA mission specialist, received the tape in the mail along with strange documents and a fingerprint from a source known only as the Guardian. In my judgment, the uh, so-called Guardian case is one of the most sophisticated and well-documented UFO cases in history. We have a videotape with some physical evidence from that. There was enough information in the package to suggest a landing site where the event occurred. We found witnesses eyewitnesses to the event. This was clearly a disc-shaped object with some rather unique looking appendages. We don't know what that really represents, but it clearly is the overall shape. And you can see that because the flares in the background are illuminating smoke, which are backlighting this object. Navy optical physicist Dr. Bruce McAbee determined that the craft hovering low above the field appears to be 25 feet in diameter. He doesn't think it's the work of a Hollywood special effects team. This was a real event witnessed by some people other than Guardian, which makes it this an important case. It's my opinion, it's not a hoax. Rather inexplicably, Canadian policeman Dennis DeHate disagrees. He believes the craft is real, but it's much more conventional. Most of the people I spoke with indicated that helicopters had been flying in the area for some time and that the sighting was not that of a UFO. In fact, as far as they're concerned, it was a helicopter. DeHate says he analyzed the footage as part of a Canadian study. After reviewing all the information, I'm convinced, and I'll always be convinced, that this is a helicopter. My response to that is it's a ridiculous explanation. And what appears in the video does not look at all like a helicopter. Dr. Maccabee's strong rebuttal is supported by an exhaustive investigation carried out by one of NASA's top computer imaging experts, Dr. Robert Nathan, who spent considerable effort analyzing the footage unofficially for a network TV program. Dr. Nathan could not explain the images and could not correlate them to any known aircraft. In addition, Dr. Nathan nor any other investigator has been able to determine what kind of technology created the strange luminosity exhibited by the dish-shaped craft, as well as the oddly strobing bright light seen above it blinking much faster than any beacon light ordinarily observed on conventional helicopters or planes. Convinced that this case might be proof that alien spacecraft are visiting Earth. Many UFO researchers worldwide hope that whoever or whatever Guardian represents will one day come forward to resolve the mysteries surrounding the footage once and for all. August 1991, Sibsey, UK. A woman notices some colored lights dancing about the end of her field. They're going back and forth in unusual patterns, which she finds strange, but doesn't get scared until one of them shoots directly at her and almost hits her farmhouse. It was a red and green, green light flashing, sort of blipping about. But instead of just being in one place, it actually was blipping here and there and all over. And I thought, well, airplanes don't do that. And we watched it come right across here and followed it right the way around to the front of the house, that side. I had no idea what it was. I didn't really think of UFO, to be quite honest. I just thought, I don't know what this is. It's strange, it's weird. And the only time I got really frightened was when it hurtled itself from that top corner of the field towards the farmhouse. And I thought it was going to smash straight into the farmhouse. I thought it was going to crash into us. The story was printed in the whole Daily Mail. Other people then wrote to the paper saying that they too had seen a similar object. I must have had between 30, 40 calls easily and all of them giving similar descriptions to red and green lights flashing. Um, and, you know, just they had no explanation. They, they just said it just was so strange. They'd seen it playing around in the sky. 
At the bottom of the field stands the Star Public House. It was at the same time that Joyce Porter saw a bright light over the farm. A big bright glow, um, just very bright, um, nothing like a star, nothing like an aircraft, or just something I just couldn't say what it was. We came down and there was um, an oblong shape about that sort of size by that, just suspended there, just this bright oblong light. And um, I, just, I just didn't know what to do then. I sort of freaked. I thought, oh God, what is it?